from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz will be in to talk about correcting acidic soils with a lime application before planting a new stand of alfalfa this fall. He'll go over why balancing that soil pH is essential for good alfalfa establishment and growth. Then a segment from another Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. This time, Brad White, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pendle will discuss genetic management of crossbred cattle and supplemental feeding considerations for the cow-calf herd to round out the summer and heading into fall. On this week's horticulture segment later then, K-State's Ward Upham looks at determining when homegrown apples, peaches, and pears are ready to pick. On this... Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Up first today, a look at the value of liming soils that are to be planted to alfalfa here in the fall. And we'll find out why that's so critical to getting that alfalfa stand off on the right foot. As joining us once more is crop nutrient specialist Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, K-State Research and Extension. And Dorvar, we do have soils that are low in pH. Those soils probably need to be adjusted if, in fact, one is seeding alfalfa on that ground, right? Absolutely. And like you mentioned, alfalfa can be particularly susceptible to low pH situations. Uh, as we know, it's a legume that fixes its own nitrogen and can be affected significantly by uh, low pH. And in general, we do have uh, even a, a slightly higher uh, target pH for alfalfa compared to other crops. And uh, again, for many reasons, one of them does is the sensitivity, but also when we are uh, planting alfalfa, obviously we're thinking about more of a long term, uh, multiple years, and uh, taking care of those issues before planting is particularly essential in this case, again, because we are talking about uh, multiple years, and we may not have the chance to go back and, and fix some uh, pH issues in alfalfa uh, like we do in other crops. But just how much lime is required to bring a given field up to good alfalfa productivity? And we, we see, of course, pH levels vary widely across the state, Dorbar. Yes, and, and that's that's an excellent point. And, and we basically need to start with a soil test, and that's really the key point here. And uh, essentially, I, I always emphasize that we're talking about a very small investment here to make sure and secure the, the level of productivity that we expect from that alfalfa field. And so at this point, this is a good time if we're thinking about fall planting or spring planting for alfalfa. We need to be thinking about soil sampling at this point and look at that pH level. At the same time, we can take advantage of that and also look at other uh, key nutrients like phosphorus and potassium. have to keep in mind that uh, alfalfa is a crop that removes significant amount of P and K as we are removing the, the entire above-ground biomass uh, as a forage. But talking about uh, pH in particular, um, the values that we typically typically look and change a little bit depending on where we are in the state. If we are in the eastern part of the state, east of the Flint Hills, uh, we typically uh, like to have a target pH of 6.8. If the soil test value come back below 6.4, then aromatically uh, we'll recommend a, a lime application in this situation. So it is a little bit higher uh, target pH, and when I say target pH, that's really the pH we were li- where we would like to have that soil for optimal production. Now, if we are in western Kansas, it's a little bit different situation, and in that case, we typically uh, would recommend lime for any soil that is below 5.8. And we like to have a target pH of 6 or higher. And so uh, essentially the pH that we are um, recommending for eastern Kansas uh, is a little bit different from western Kansas. And the main reason for this is the soil types. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about eastern Kansas, we tend to have a acidic subsoil. 
And so we basically want to make sure and we have optimum conditions in the upper layer of, of that soil to ensure uh, optimum production. Now, again, if we are in western Kansas, the nature of our soils in western Kansas, we do tend to have a calcareous subsoils. The subsoil tends to be higher in pH, so we can afford to basically um, tolerate basically a slightly lower pH situation near the surface. So that's that's the main difference that's here, and I think this is important to keep in mind. This, of course, is built into our recommendation, the region uh, for this production. But again, we have to keep in mind also not just the surface, but also what's happening in the subsoil. And uh, as far as the topsoil is concerned, the texture of that soil does make a difference as well, whether it's a the, clay soil or a sandy soil, yes, right? And, yes. Yes, and this brings the next point, which is basically how we calculate that a lime rate of, of application. And, and, and this is where we talk about buffer pH. And as if you're looking at your soil test report, you typically get the pH, and, and then you have another number there that is the buffer pH. And, and the pH is basically telling you whether or not we can have a potential issue with acidity. And the buffer pH is the actual value that we use to make that calculation. So in this case, we essentially have a buffer, basically a solution that resists basically to, to changes in pH that buffer is typically a pH of 7.5. And as we are mixing that with the soil in the lab, depending on how much of that pH will drop, that is basically related to the potential acidity of that soil and related to the, the amount of lime that we need to apply. And this is exactly where things like texture uh, comes into play. In other words, uh, if you're looking at a soil that is medium, fine texture soil, usually you have more reserve acidity. And again, that change in pH, that buffer uh, capacity of that soil is bigger. And typically, again, that will may result in higher lime application. Sandy soils uh, typically will have uh, a lower buffer, less reserve acidity, and we typically less, need to put less uh, lime application. However, the change in, in acidity also happens faster in a, in a sandy soil. So oftentimes we'll tend to uh, apply perhaps less lime, but more often we'll need to lime those sandy soils compared to a fine textured soils. Again, all of this going back to that buffer capacity, the reserve acidity of that particular soil. So this is very important and, and one of the reasons why we need to check pH um, before the main crops and again, especially before um, alfalfa in this particular case, because every soil is different. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to application rates, lime to uh, soils to be planted to alfalfa, well, there's the standard value by which all of that is built. That's called the ECC for short. Yes, and, and this is the, the next uh, key concept that we need to keep in mind when it comes to lime because we always have this question. We have different sources, and depending on where you are in the state, you may be dealing with different types of lime materials. Some of them are just a regular lime, pelletized lime, and so on, and, and they are all slightly different. And ultimately, we basically have to calculate that rate based on a, a uniform unit, which is the effective calcium carbonate. That effective calcium carbonate basically have two components. One is the purity of that lime material, uh, basically the calcium carbonate component. And the second component is how fine is that material. Uh, that will basically uh, determine how reactive that material is going to be in the soil and ultimately, again, changing that pH in the soil. So you have those two components going in that calculation. And essentially, we're putting all of them in the same units, if you will, uh, which is the effective calcium carbonate. So... If we're talking about units of effective calcium carbonate, from that standpoint, the different lime sources are basically the same because, again, we are measuring in, in, the, in the same units. However, again, the different sources may vary in terms of cost, in terms of uh, availability. In some parts of the state, we may not have uh, some source of, of lime available. Uh, ultimately, the main uh, driving uh, point here would be the cost and how economical it would be to use some of these different source of limes, uh, either regular ag lime or uh, pale lime or any other source. Again, uh, economics will be a big factor here. So one wants to make those source comparisons on the basis of the cost per pound of ECC, you say? Absolutely. That's, that's ultimately what we want is what's that cost per pound. And again, in many cases, it's really also availability for the producer, uh, which again, oftentimes will be related to also to cost. And then it comes around to application method. In a perfect world, surface applied 
would be as advantageous as anything, right? Yes. And, and again, if we are talking about alfalfa, typically we're uh, thinking about preparing that seed bed. And, and uh, in many cases, that would be conventional tillage. Uh, and so ideally, this is, again, the time where we need to be thinking about this lime application where we can apply broadcast surface and ideally incorporate that lime so we have that reaction with the soil and, and we uh, increase the pH. So that will be the, the ideal situation. And we're talking about the application rates. We are assuming that there's going to be incorporation to about six inch depth. So that's also another factor that goes into the calculation. We're basically assuming that there's going to be a volume of soil to a depth of six inches. Mm -hmm. A different situation if we do uh, have a, a no-till alfalfa, which is uh, in that case we're going to be broadcasting that lime. We are not going to incorporate that lime. In that scenario, we're basically assuming that that lime is going to move roughly two and a half to three inches. So again, that's also affecting your uh, application rates. And this is very important. When we get samples in the soil testing lab, we need to have that information. If the producer is not clarifying whether this is going to be uh, incorporated or it's going to be not till broadcast on the surface, that rate can be different and may not be the right one. So we need to have that type of information for accurate uh, calculation of the, of, the ultimate, of the rate. But one can be successful in a no-till or limited-till situation with applying lime without incorporation as long as they manage it correctly. Yes, and as long uh, as, again, the rate is, is the right one. And, and it, like I say, in this case, the only difference is that that lime is going to be reacting primarily with the upper three inch of, of soil. And yes, uh, that could be also a successful system. It's just um, uh, different, and we need to account for that in terms of the application rate. And Dorovar, by the way, has authored an article on this very matter entitled Liming Prior to Fall Seeding of Alfalfa. It's in the Agronomy e-Update newsletter series, the issue dated Friday, July the 20th. If you'd like to read up more about this at agronomy.ksu.edu. Timely word. Thanks, Dorovar, for coming over. Thank you. Once again, watching those pH levels on ground to be sown to alfalfa this fall, our topic, with Dorvar Ruiz Diaz. He is a crop nutrient specialist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back with more on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Listening to Agriculture Today and coming your way now, this week's installment of the BCI Cattle Chat podcast, where the K-State researchers who staff the Beef Cattle Institute here on the campus get together to casually discuss topical matters in beef cattle production and management. Answering the roll call this week, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, agricultural economist Dustin Pendle, and veterinarian Brad White, who again moderates this conversation. We got a question from one of our listeners, and Bob, I'll, I'll turn it to you. We The question was, if you've got a, and they've got Angus... Herford heifers, Angus cross Herford heifers, so yep. typically we think of as a black white face. And the question was, what should we breed those two to produce the best commercial beef? So you, yeah. you got to kind of define right. you, what are the targets. Yeah, what's the target? And I think in, in any time we talk about a, a breeding system, whether that's a, a cross breeding one or a straight breeding one, one of the things we need to, to sort of clearly define, uh, and not surprisingly, is what is our market target, right? So um, having a clear idea of where we need to go sort of helps guide the decision making process and so real real briefly i would i would say you know probably two primary uh, if it's a smaller producer 
maybe two potential market targets. One of those might be we're going to sell weaned calves um, through kind of a conventional sale barn marketing scenario. And in that case, black baldy cows um, mated to some kind of terminal type bull maybe can be um, uh, a way so to what go. Are, if what, are some examples, what, are, what are some examples well, of so when you're it, saying terminal type bull, what do, you, what do you mean? Yeah, so something that's really high growth. We would traditionally think of those as uh, maybe some of the continental breeds like uh, Gelpie or Simmental, Charlet, Limousin, those kinds of breeds. Um, although, you know, the British breeds have really changed a lot in terms of their growth potential. So you could potentially think about maybe picking a terminal type Angus bull um, to go into that that system as well. Um, but when you say terminal, though, we're not, would you, would you recommend keeping replacement heifers out of that mating? Probably not. Um, so terminal means sell all of them through the, the marketing channel and, and not retain any of those heifer calves back as, as replacements. We, we can do a better job targeting our our selection emphasis if we really focus on, you know, are we going to build replacement females or are we going to breed um, calves for the marketplace and kind of separate those maternal terminal mating decisions. I did note on on the thing, though, it says heifers. So um, if these are uh, first calf uh, or virgin heifers that we're going to breed for their first calf, usually calving ease is a, is a really big criteria. And we can add some other things, you know, breeds of um, improved calving ease performance a lot, so we can actually make some calves that have a fair bit of, of performance and growth to them. You know, the, the other piece that comes in here is if, if we're going to target for, say somebody's thinking about you know, niche markets, maybe they're going to do some custom freezer beef uh, kind of marketing. You know, one of the British breeds like Angus or Red Angus that brings marbling to the table and sort of fleshing ability would be a, a good choice. And, and you can manage kind of the, the carcass and calving ease components of that pretty well in that sort Systems. So, so we have talk plan, about the we talk about the value of heterosis, and the, they mentioned in this case Angus Hereford cross heifers, mm-hmm. and then you said one of your options was breed back to a British breed. Does that lose some of our heterosis? Do we still get as yeah, much great, value? Great question. So, um, real quickly, the, the the heterosis benefits roughly fall out. About two thirds of the economic benefit comes from having crossbred cows and one-third from having crossbred calves. And in gross, worth about, in today's market, somewhere uh, an F1 female made it to a third breed bull, that nets about 150 bucks a cow a year. So let's say 100 of that, two-thirds of it, is roughly the value of having that crossbred cow. Certainly that's the, the biggest chunk and the, and the one that's ultimately maybe the hardest to capture and manage, but the most important. And so, you know, in a case where we go back and say use an Angus bull on these black baldy heifers, we lose heterosis in the calf, a uh, half of it, in fact, but we've still got all the heterosis in the cow. And so we, we capture, in that case, somewhere about $120 or $25 worth of, of heterosis value in that system. But certainly, thing to, you know, you, you don't want to sort of wish away $50 of, of calf value by making calves more straight bread. So you know, kind of think through that plan. But they've and they've done well so far with having crossbred yeah, they, heifers step, there. Step one's crossbred heifers. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's a good plan. And and really, what we want to do is have a plan and figure out if we're doing a terminal cross, or are we making more heifers? Yep. Are we selling at weaning? Are we selling finished beef? And planning that out is is an important step because yep. too often it seems like the momentum just we're just going to get this type of bull, put it on the cows, and yeah. keep doing the same thing. And sometimes the easy thing is not always the most profitable. Thing. Exactly. I'll put, I'll put a link in the in the show notes, uh, a chapter or two out of uh, a beef sire selection manual that I've authored on this very topic. In fact, Excellent. so excellent. Yep. So speaking of the easy things, not always the way to go. A lot of times we put up hay this time of year. We've put up our feed supplies. We're feeling pretty good going into winter. Or we've got some storage. One of the questions that you had was thinking about forage testing. So should we test that now? Should we wait until it's seasoned, until we get closer to winter? What's the appropriate? Yeah, so great, great question. I was thinking about this on the way in. I saw a fair number of folks kind of rolling up some some later season prairie hay and got me thinking about you know forage testing. And, and one of the strategies that I want our, our producers to think about is, you know, as you start accumulating forage, and I know in this part of the state there's been a lot of ground, CRP ground released for some grazing and haying activities. CRP hay probably historically wouldn't have the same kind of nutrient analysis as a typical harvested prairie hay. And so getting that product tested so you kind of know what you've got and think of, 
forward about what other supplementation might I need to provide to those cows, principally in the area of protein, right? So we know those cows, you know, late gestation, particularly after we wean calves, nutrient demand's not that huge, but it's an opportunity if we need to put some body condition score back on cows, you've got about a 100-day window in there to do that very cost effectively if you wait until cows are you know right up in front of calving or post calving accumulating body condition score is really difficult and expensive so figuring out what what you've got in terms of forage resource between now and calving you then know what do i need to buy some distillers or cubes or what do i need to maybe alpha alpha hay some kind of protein supplement to meet those protein requirements for cows and having a plan is critical because dustin you talked a couple weeks ago about when you did the cow-calf survey you looked at the high profit producers low profit producers hay cost feed cost was one of the big differences between those groups right and i don't recall the exact numbers off the top of my head but i mean you're talking 60 70 percent of your total variable costs are related to feed yeah um, so so planning out how to best utilize that available forage and feed stuff and, and we typically think of that through the winter so we've got spring calvers we're thinking about through the winter how are we going to feed them what about right now? So these cows, a lot of spring calvers are early to mid gestation when typically I think of coasting. Can we just coast through this time period? Yeah, so there's uh, actually some, some pretty interesting research done. Researchers at North Dakota State and University of Nebraska kind of been leaders in this area in the, in the area of fetal programming and understanding what sort of gestational nutrition or insults to nutrition have on subsequent calf performance. The data, is, I, th- I think it's really interesting in that um, it sort of points to the idea that if we supplement, particularly some of the work Rick Funston did in Nebraska was around this idea of protein supplementation of cows. The subsequent calves, uh, so this would be mid to late gestation differences in, in protein supplementation, adequate or slightly restricted. And what they found was the calf performance to weaning was better, better rate of puberty by the beginning of the breeding season, better conception rates, and better performance of those replacement heifers for their first calves. Which is um, amazing when you think about that the nutrition during mid-gestation, so that calf's not even born yet, yeah. affected for their life yeah or at least through weaning and through breeding yeah it, it had uh, substantial impacts and not really any any differences in, in dry matter intake or average daily gain of those animals or feed efficiency of the the subsequent calves but big differences in sort of uh, gain performance so i kind of think start thinking about it as you know we, we can measure chronologic age right so the days they are in gestation the days of age after birth but there's also physiological maturity, right? And so I'm wondering if, if some of these calves, that when you have appropriate nutrition, they're just more physiologically mature at any chronological point in time. During gestation. Because what, why? Well, what happens? Do yeah, we know so, why? Um, the, uh, uh, and I'll put both of these links in, in the show notes. There's a, a follow-up paper that researchers are trying to understand this sort of mechanism. And so they've done some follow-up work, which really is change in nutrition of cows, uh, or they did a set of heifers, immediately after so it was common diet to breeding ai bread synchronized ai bread put on one of two uh diets one was about a 60 percent restriction um the other one was a diet to gain about a pound a day fed them for 50 days took uh hysterectomies of those cows took the conceptus um did a bunch of rna work so measuring differing levels of gene expression for various proteins in different tissues and they found differences so there's an up and down regulation of different gene sets based on nutritional application so so the nutrition to the dam affected the gene expression, expression by the calf by the fetus yep. yeah 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 so, and it's really we can't coast at any time but you don't have to have a high plan of nutrition you just need to have adequate, adequate. nutrition is what the research has shown right. is if it's right. restricted is when we run into some of those issues so adequate is good you don't have to feed them a lot during this time of year and their maintenance requirements are typically less at this time of year so in mid gestation so we we've enjoyed having you with us this week and we look forward to talk to you again next week that's a segment of this week's bci cattle chat featuring k-state's brad white dustin pindle and bob weber They welcome your questions for the next podcast, and to find out how to pose those and or to listen to this week's podcast in its entirety, go to beefcattleinstitute.org, beefcattleinstitute.org. This is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers. 
dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to our Thursday edition of Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Now a few moments to catch up on the day's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. With the U.S. corn crop in the dough stage and soybeans setting pods now, the USDA will reveal the findings of its first farm surveys of 2018 and will post new yield estimates for row crops. And traders will also be interested in changes in the world wheat crop estimates after dry weather concerns increased over the past month. The USDA releasing its August crop production and world agricultural supply and demand estimate reports at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Here's a preview from the USDA's Gary Crawford. We are just hours away from the first USDA crop forecasts based on inspections by USDA's statistics service of thousands of fields and surveys of over 20,000 farmers. But at this point in the growing season, they weight it heavily towards farmer surveys. Seth Meyer runs the USDA's World Outlook Board. He says, yes, it is true. The crop's a little more mature than average, so they'll get, they'll actually be able to measure a few more things, but they're still going to be relying an awful lot on what the farmers have to say. How close will this first forecast be to the final harvest? <laughs> well, Meyer says, conditions have been pretty good and pretty stable over the life of this crop, but historically the August one just kind of gets you into the ballpark, but you don't know if you're uh, on the pitcher's mound or you're up in the bleacher seats in the corner. Uh, for example, last August, Traders thought USDA's August corn forecast was far too high. 14.2 billion bushels turned out to be 14.6. So we'll see. The crop estimate from the Statistics Service and the forecast for export stocks and prices from Myers Outlook Board both will be out Friday noon Eastern Time. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And right here on tomorrow's broadcast, we'll find out what K-State grain market economist Dan O'Brien thinks those reports will have to say. He'll join us then. Meantime, Brazil's agriculture agency, CONNAB, has cut its forecast for the Brazilian corn harvest in the 1718 season due to less than normal rain in some areas. It did raise its estimate for the soybean harvest slightly. CONNAB forecast a total corn crop of 82 million acres, or metric tons, that is, in the 1718 season, down from the agency forecast in July slightly. Brazil's corn harvest for 1617, 97 million tons for compared The lack of rain in some corn-producing areas corresponded with a period in which precipitation is vital to plant development. Brazilian producers producing a record 119 million metric tons of soybeans in the season, according to CONAB, up from its estimate of 118 million in July. And Brazil, to a reference, produced 114 million tons of beans in the 1617 season. That was the previous record. And pushing back on the White House tariff strategy, the group Farmers for Free Trade announced yesterday it plans to buy advertising in radio, television, and print that will run in Kansas, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. Farmers for Free Trade is a bipartisan group started by former Senators Richard Luger of Indiana and Max Baucus of Montana. The group's board president, Sarah Lilligren, said, that the ads will speak to farmers who are seeing tariffs force down the prices of their crops and livestock. Lilligren, by the way, a former executive vice president for Tyson Foods, now a freelance communications consultant. Want to fill in further details on that second of three Kansas Livestock Association K-State Ranch Management Field Days set for this coming Monday the 13th in Gove County at the Remington Ranch. Tyler and Cassie Remington will host the field day near Quinter uh, Monday, August the 13th. Utilizing cover crops and annual forages to boost grazing opportunities will highlight the field day program. K-State's John Holman and a panel of Western Kansas producers will share their experiences with with incorporating these forages into their grazing programs. John has conducted 10 years of research on the viability and the advisability of planting annual cover crops or forages.
ranges in conjunction with conventional dryland cropping systems in western Kansas. He'll discuss all that. Also on the program, Jamie Sire, the Northwest District Forester with the Kansas Forest Service in Hayes, will be explaining the process of renovating old and or environmentally stressed windbreaks, planning and establishing new windbreaks, and plant selection. And there's much more to the program. It'll get going with registration at 3 o'clock Monday afternoon, concluding with that free beef dinner at 645 at the Remington Ranch near Quinter, the K-State KLA Ranch Management Field Day, set for this coming Monday afternoon, August the 13th. Hope you can make it. Now, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Russell Plashka, Agribusiness Development Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, is joining us. And Russell, coming up on August the 23rd, it is the third annual Kansas Governor Summit on Agricultural Growth in Manhattan. We are very excited to host our third annual conference, Greg. Um, and it's and I say ours, it's really the industries as a whole conference. And we really look forward to it this year as we're really going to uh, drill down and focus in on some issues this year. What are some of the main things that's going to be discussed? Well, we've got our sectors broken into 19 different sectors, of course. And within those sectors, the past couple of years, we've really tried to hone in on what the objectives are and what some of the action items that needed to be prioritized. And from there, a lot of the things, we've had some successes here and there that we'll discuss during the summit and during those sector breakouts. But this year, we really want to focus in on the who the what and the when. So we really want our producers and our business and industry and our associations to really focus on what really needs to happen now and who is going to kind of step up and take charge of that. And then when do we want to complete it by, whether it's six months, a year, two years, whatever the case may be. And this is really an opportunity for anybody to come with their input because you want it to really be a cooperative setting. The more the merrier. We want a really good cross-section. We want to see our farmers and ranchers there. We want to see our agribusinesses there, and we want to see our associations, our partners that are leading the industry on the front. We want everybody to come together. Definitely, it's not a state-run summit. It is a cooperative approach from all areas. There is no cost to attend, but you are asking people to register more for the materials for attendees and, of course, meals as well? There is absolutely no cost to it. We will have uh, a social the night before, and there will be an eggs and issues breakfast the next morning at 7, and then as well as a lunch. So, yes, we want people to come on and register for that, and they can register at our website, and that's agriculture.ks.gov slash summit. And it's really about the future of Kansas agriculture and where it takes it. I kind of compare it to if somebody belongs to a professional organization each year, they kind of reevaluate their goals and objectives and where they want to head for the next year. In this case, we're talking about an entire industry. Where do we want to see ourselves six months to five years down the road? That is Russell Plashka, Agribusiness Development Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Now for you on Agriculture Today, our weekly K-State horticulture segment. And the focus this time around is on tree fruit harvest. It is that time of the season once again for many of our popular tree fruits out there. Guidelines are important here to assure ripeness. And for those, we turn once again to K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Ward Upham. Well, Ward, we'll walk through three of the more popular fruits, peaches, apples, and pears. But in each case, one has to be pretty well on top of that ripeness to get a good quality product, don't they? That's right. A lot of people this year don't have peaches, but there are some that do, and so we want to cover that. Usually, it's a good idea to leave those peaches on the tree until they're fully ripe, if you can. 
The problem with that is we often have problems with birds and maybe green June beetles that are going to get into that ripe fruit. So you may want to pick it early. If you do this right, you're not going to lose really any quality of that fruit. So you're going to pick it when it's hard. It's not going to be soft at all. What you look for are two different things. One is the color, but that's not the general color of that fruit. It's the color that's on the stem part of that fruit. If you look down in that little basin, that will turn from kind of a lightish green into more of a a yellow color. When that happens, that fruit is going to be ready to go. Double check that though. If it is actually ready to go, it's going to come off that tree easily. Just lift it up, twist it a little bit, and if it comes off, you're ready to go. So you don't usually with peaches pick everything at once. It's going to be maybe three or four pickings. But always check to make sure that fruit comes off easily. can still be hard, but if it comes off easily, it's ready to go. Just ripen it inside at room temperature, and it'll only take a few days for it to come uh, completely ripe. And it won't take a quality hit by ripening off the tree whatsoever then? It will not. As long as you pick it at that stage, you're going to be fine. And there will be good and juicy, uh, really good fruit. Now, apples are, well, more commonplace in Kansas because they simply do better in our climate. And the nice thing you say about them, Ward, is that they have a longer ripening period. They do. I mean, we have apples that will ripen in July. We have apples that will ripen clear in November. And so depending on variety, you can have apples that are ripening all through that period. And so sometimes it can be a little difficult to know exactly when your apple is going to ripen. One of the first things you look at is in that description of that variety, they'll often give you the days from bloom that'll be ready to harvest. For example, Jonathan is 135. Both Golden Delicious and Red Delicious are 145. That's days from bloom. That just gives you an idea. It does not mean that you can just count off those days and on that day you harvest. It's a ballpark, it is. if you will. So it depends on what the weather was like. You know, last year we had kind of a cool summer and they would have been a little bit later than normal. This year we had an extremely hot summer, which probably sped things up. And so we'll probably be harvesting a little bit quicker than we normally would. If you're unsure, one of the things you can look is just cut open an apple and look at the seed color. If it's not brown, if it's white, you're not even close, okay? Also, the flesh color gives you an idea as well. It'll be a whitish color, but it may have a greenish tinge. Again, if it has a greenish tinge, then you need to wait uh, some more time. What I look for, again, is some of the same things I look for on the peaches. In other words, I look for that color change right around that stem, or you can, on apples, look on the calyx part, too. That's the bottom part of that fruit. That is going to change, again, from a kind of a greenish color to more of a light yellow or a tan. And when that happens, it may be mature. So the last test is flavor. Just take a bite out of that apple and see if it's ready to go. And so that will give you an idea. So look at that color change right around the stem and then do the taste test. When they're ready, they're ready. So you have multiple ways of determining apple ripeness, and once more, that could stretch out over a long time. So you'll need to be checking your apple crop with some frequency here. And then uh, pears. And there are a few folks that do raise homegrown pears as well out there, and they're maybe even more forgiving. In some ways, they are. The thing that you don't want to do with pears is let them ripen on a tree. I mean, most people think that's where you're going to get the highest quality fruit. Not true with pears. You run into two problems if you do that. One is that flesh tends to become gritty, and so it's not as smooth as it would be if you pick them early. The second thing is that pears ripen from the inside out. And so if you let them ripen on a tree, especially in some years, you're going to have the inside of that fruit be kind of dark and mushy if you let the outside ripen completely. That may be more of a problem this year since we had so much hot weather early. Uh, We've already seen some samples of that where people have cut open their pears and they're already dark and mushy. So that makes it more tricky in determining when to pick. So what does one go by? So what you look at are the lenticels. Now the lenticels are the breathing pores of that fruit. If you look at a pear, you'll notice it has a lot of little white specks on that fruit. Those are the lenticels. Those are the breathing pores. Those, as that fruit matures, are going to turn from white to a corky color. So as long as they're white, you know that fruit isn't 
close to being ripe. So what you look for is a change in those lenticels from white to corky, and then also look at a difference in the ground color. Ground color is everything else, the color of the rest of that fruit, other than the lenticels. And so that will go from a darker green to a lighter green or maybe even a yellowish green or reddish green, you know, something like that. And then what I do as a final test is see if that fruit comes off the tree easily. Uh, same thing that we did with the peaches. And so you lift it up, give it a twist. If it comes off, it's ready to go. Okay. So once you got them picked, if you can, it's best if you can cool them down really fast. It actually helps the quality of that fruit. If you have enough room in the fridge or if you use an ice bath to get that temperature lowered quickly, it'll actually help the quality of that fruit. And then store them in a cool atmosphere as well. That's right. As cool as you can do. You know, if you, if you have a basement or that's cool, that's fine. If you have a refrigerator, that's even better. You know, just put them in a plastic bag, but don't close the bag. You don't want moisture to be trapped in there. But that will keep the humidity high enough that they'll be fine. Once you're ready to ripen them, just take them out, put them between 60 and 65 degrees if you can do that, and they'll ripen in one to three weeks. And they'll be much higher quality than if you let them ripen on a tree. And once again, there's information on fruit harvest through the K-State Horticulture Channels, including the Rapid Response Center that Ward maintains here at the university. That's at 785-532-1438. As always, Ward, thanks for coming over. You bet. K-State Research and Extension Horticulturist Ward Upham, our guest on this week's Horticulture segment. Thanks for tuning in, and please rejoin us here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.